I'm Rachel and I have a life hack that my friend showed me and I thought I would share it with you. Um, so I'm going to show you how to easily separate a yolk from an egg white. First thing you're going to do is break your egg into your bowl. Being careful not to break the yolk. Then you take a plastic water bottle and you gently suck it up into the bottle and you've got your egg yolk. That's my life hack. It's my privilege and honor to introduce the new five-week sermon series on life hacks. And you know, I'll be quite honest with you, I didn't know what a life hack was, and I needed some help to figure out what this word is and what we're preaching about and everything, and so I thought about Googling it, and then I thought, no, a better way, I'm gonna ask Pastor Rob Denton. And so, if you look at the screen with me, here is what Rob told me about life hacks. Life hacks are simple, out-of-the-box solutions for everyday problems. Certain life hacks seem to be too obvious to be true, and others seem impossible to pull off. Soda can tabs, rubber, rubber bands, duct tape, toothpaste, and tennis balls are just a few of the items laying around that people may use to solve life's challenges. In this series, we will take a look at the greatest solutions to all of life's problems, it is the Bible. It has the power to change your life. It is the greatest like life hack of all time. Isn't that great? Well, I, I, I think we know more about the life hacks, but you know, some people think that the greatest things about life hacks are like WD-40 and duct tape. So look at, the, look at this slide up here. You need only two tools in life, WD-40 and duct tape. If it doesn't move and should, use WD-40. If it moves and shouldn't, use duct tape. You can identify with that, right? Well, the, the title of today's sermon is Duct Tape Works Wonders. But Rob asked me to preach from Jesus in Matthew 6, 1 through 4, which we're going to turn there in just a minute. But there we, f we find out in that scripture that it's generosity and it is unselfishness that works wonders just like duct tape, except much, much better, right? And if it's that important, we need to look at this. And so we're going to pray, and then we're going to pass out our Bibles, and we will talk about what it says about generosity and unselfishness and how that works wonderfully. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for every person that is here today. Please quiet our spirits and help us, Lord, to focus on you and be ready to focus on your word. We want to be still and know who you are. Be reminded that you're the creator of the universe and of each one of us, and that you are unlimited by knowledge and wisdom and power and authority and location or time or space. Unlimited in all of those. Lord, you are truly the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we desire for you to speak to us and tell us today why you would want us to be unselfish and why you would want us to be generous. May you use me as your spokesman today and help each one of us to feel like that you can talk to us individually about what you want us to hear from this message today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 6, and if you don't have a Bible, we have some ushers that are bringing some Bibles down. Also, some of you use your apps, and that's fine. Where's Matthew? It's in the second half of the Bible we call the New Testament, and it is the first uh, book. And we're going to Matthew 6 in the first four verses. Matthew chapter 6 in the first four verses. If you don't have a Bible, put your name in this and keep it, because we want you to have a Bible that would be great. So in Matthew chapter 6, it's a great sermon because some think this is the greatest sermon that Jesus ever preached. When he laid out like Magna Carta, what his kingdom was going to be like and what he wanted it to be like. And so is everybody there in Matthew 6 someplace? I hope. You out there? Still out there? Okay, good, good, good. 
Look with me, and I'm going to do this a little differently than I maybe have sometimes in the past. And I may stop at certain places and emphasize and go slower or go faster. So hang on to your seatbelt, and uh, let's see where God leads us on this. Jesus is talking, and he says two words to begin in Matthew 6, verse 1. Be careful. And let me tell you, when Jesus says, be careful, we got to be careful. So turn to your neighbor on each side of you and say, be careful. careful. All right, be careful, because Jesus is telling us to be careful. We want to make sure we're, we're not missing things. So how are we supposed to be careful? We're supposed to be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men. So we've got a no-no we're supposed to avoid. What is an act of righteousness? That's an act of benevolence. It's an act of charity. It's when you do something for those that are needy or poor or really need some help. That would be called an act of righteousness. Jesus says, do not do that in a way that you just want to be seen by people, by humans. He says, if you do, Jesus says, you will have no reward. That means no reward, not even a little itty bit not even a little itty bit of reward do you get if you do things just to be seen. You'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. And in verse 2, there's that word so. Can I drag it out a little bit? It's like the conclusion word based on what he said or the therefore word. So, when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets. What in the world does that mean? I preached a lot on this, and I learned something new this week. I'm always learning new things when I study the Bible. But you did, did you know that they actually, that was what they did? Whenever the people that wanted to give gifts to needy or to the poor, they would blast a trumpet sound, and the needy and the poor knew they were going to get gifts, and so they would come running to wherever the trumpet sound was. That wasn't such a bad idea if you don't know where the poor are or you don't know who the needy are. I mean, that would be a way to gather them. And it probably started out as a good thing. But then as it evolved, the people that were giving the gifts got motivated, got greedy, got uh, prideful about it, and it became the wrong motive. And that was a problem. And that's why Jesus said, don't do that. Don't announce your gifts to the needy with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. You know the word hypocrites, maybe you've heard enough sermons that you've heard preachers say this, but the Greek word hypocrite, we would also translate it as actor, an actor. Not a bad word, it's just uh, an actor is one who is pretending to be something in character to someone he's really not. And so a hypocrite is one who appears to be some way, but he's really not like that. So let's go on and see what Jesus said. He said, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, blowing the trumpet, getting credit, to be honored by men, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Now when Jesus says, I tell you the truth, we need to listen. He says, this is the truth. They have received their reward in full. The applause of men, good job, that's A full reward, Jesus says. But in verse 3, there's that word but. But slowly, when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Let that word sink in. You know, if you give to help people in secret, it's not easy for them not to know who did it. But I think this is what Jesus was talking about. If you're helping the needy and the poor and those that really need help, it's hard to do it without connecting some way with them for the help process. So you have to really work at it to do this in secret. Secret means they don't know who helped them. So. Jesus goes on in verse 4 to say, Then your Father, God, who sees what is done in secret, will, will reward you. Do we just give to get rewards even if it's from God? Wrong motive. Even when we do for God, we're not focusing on any reward He would ever do for us. 
That's just a byproduct of what God blesses us with. Well, my friends, preaching this sermon to you guys is hard. Why? Because this congregation is one of the most unselfish, generous congregations that I know of. Factually, because people have told us, not because we've sought the information, some of the financial institutions that are over um, Christian giving in churches all over the country, they said, we only know one other church that we know of in the United States of America that gives more per capita than West Valley Christian Church. Sometimes you've heard us say that before. Uh, we want to encourage you there. And maybe I'm losing my blessing by, t- by telling you this. I understand what you're thinking and saying. But I want to say, God has used you to be unselfish and generous not just financially, but in all kinds of ways. That is the DNA of this congregation. So why do I need to preach on unselfishness and generosity today? Because we all need to continue to grow as long as we're on this earth. There is not a ceiling on our generosity and on our unselfishness. So I want to ask a question, which on your screen you will see the question. What are the right motives for benevolence giving? To honor and glorify God. That's why we do what we do. Do you know what Jesus said in Matthew 25? Remember what he said? When you help people that need help and that are needy, you're not just doing it for them, you're doing this for me. Remember when he said that? And so a gift to help others is not just to perform something needed on this earth. It is to bring glory. We do it because of Jesus, because we want to glorify Him for what He has done for us. It is not to glorify self. I think sometimes all of us have done things at first because we had the right motives, and that kind of grew. Us preachers have to work real hard at this when you guys are so kind to us and say, good sermon, pastor, and so on and so forth. And after a while, it's like, don't you want to say something to me? You know, <laughs> maybe give me a hint. It starts out being humble, but Satan is pretty tricky. Before long, we catch ourselves doing it to glorify ourselves. The right motives for benevolence giving is no display, no parade, no trumpets, no self-credit. Only a quietness of spirit and a single goal to bring glory to God and honor to God. God sees our humility and He sees our correct motives and He rewards us in His own way and in His own time. The Bible says, humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. We don't have to lift ourselves up. We don't have to hint around. We just need to do things to glorify God. There is no reward for self-righteousness. That makes Jesus unhappy, probably even makes Him sick. Definitely would be lukewarm doing things for ourselves. There are 10 things that I learned in this. I don't expect you to write down everything, but if you are taking notes, one of the things, since I'm not preaching every week like I used to all the time, I bring a notebook with me and I take notes on whoever is preaching because it helps me learn. And it keeps me awake so I don't fall asleep, Ken. (laughs) He doesn't fall asleep either, but some people have before. But it's hard to go to sleep when you're writing. So these are the the 10 lessons that I picked up that I pass on to you. Uh, They're kind of sentences a little too long to write everything, but you might write a word or something if you find one that really speaks to you. The first lesson that I learned is the right motive for giving to others is our gratitude for the generosity of God to us. I want to say that again. I believe this is one of the important ones I learned. The right motive for giving to others is our gratitude for the generosity of God to us. Listen here on this one. The reason for not being generous is because we are not grateful. 
or not grateful enough. Hard to examine my own life or my own generosity, my own self unselfishness as I was preparing for the sermon this week. Because I'm not totally excited about what I see in my own generosity and my own unselfishness. I'm sure you can probably identify with that. If we want to be more generous, we've got to look at God, look at what he's done for us. How long has it been since we've thanked God for a hot shower, for clean water, for um, the beautiful weather that we live right here in Southern California as compared to the weather all over the world? We have many, many things. I love people when they come to me and tell me how things aren't quite right in their lives and I say, I think, I don't always get to say this because they're not ready to hear it yet. Take a blank piece of paper and a pencil and just start writing down your blessings. And if you can't figure it out, come in, we'll schedule an hour and I'll help you write your list. The right motive for giving to others is to be grateful for the generosity of God to us. And then you just flow with generosity. I know I'm preaching to the choir. Number two, the wrong motive for giving to others is to gain for ourselves. Wanting credit, I can identify with this because um, one of my love languages, if you've ever read that book, is words and affirmation. <laughs> So this is one of those that God talks about. We're encouraged to encourage each other. It's not a bad thing. But we've got to want to give credit to God more than we want and need credit for ourselves. The wrong motive is for giving to others is to gain for yourself is the motive. Number three, don't reach in your pocket with one hand and put up, up your other hand and say, look at me. Number four, I learned, is that righteousness from the heart is always the right motive. Do you remember what the Psalms talks about? Psalm 51, the sacrifices that God is pleased with is a broken spirit and a contrite heart. That's humility, that's unselfishness. That's wanting to give credit to God, not wanting to take credit for ourselves. Number five, I learned, Hypocrisy is doing the right things with the wrong motives. Now think about that one with me. If you blow the trumpet and you give out gifts to the needy and the poor, they get gifts either way that they need, right? Whether it's for the right motives or not, sometimes we do the right things, but we're doing it for the wrong motives. And God says, I'm not pleased with that. I'm not happy about that. I want you to give because your heart is involved not your pride. Righteousness from the heart is always the right motives and hypocrisy is doing the right things uh, with the right motives, not the wrong motives. Number six, the great contrast is the great show versus the great secret. Let me say that again. The great contrast is the great show over here or the great secret over here. The right reason I remind you to give to others is gratitude to God for what he has done. Frankly, I've had to practice because it was the right thing to do is necessary. It's been a growing experience. Um, this is the first time that I preached in two years since I retired from the senior pastor position. Not because I couldn't have preached more but I told Rob, I, I, I want you to have uh, Josh and uh, John preach. They're in their 40s, and I'm in my <laughs> I, will be, I will be 70 um, next month, if I live that long. <laughs> but we, we need to... Um, We need to give 
to others out of gratitude for what God has done for us. Uh, number seven, I want you to write down, when we give in secret, God sees and God rewards. Senior moment. Now I remember what I was going to say earlier. <laughs> that in the last two years, I've had to uh, not say as much as I had the two years before, and I didn't realize how much I like to talk. <laughs> but it's been a growing experience and a good experience to be quieter and to think more about what I say before I say it. And before I realized, man, I was just saying things and not, not doing a good job of thinking of what I was saying and how that was impacting people. Now I still have to think about what I say every day, like you do too. But we need to, uh, we need to think about what we're saying before we say them. We need to uh, concentrate on getting away from the, the visibility of others. Uh, number eight, when we give to be seen by people, God gives no credit, no reward to us. Not even a little, not, not even a, a little bit. Number nine is what I learned is that God rewards genuine generosity and genuine unselfishness. When we are generous or unselfish and not sincere, it is fakey, doesn't come across real, and God doesn't want that. It's genuine generosity, genuine un unselfishness. Number 10, generosity always comes from gratitude. And if there is none or little generosity, it's because we have none or little gratitude. So I'm gonna let, let me ask you a question as I ask myself. How's your gratitude? H how is your gratitude doing? I'm not assuming that it's not in the right place. I'm just asking. So how's your generosity? When you look at your generosity as you have opportunities, which we all do every day and every week, do you have a generous spirit? Would people say that about you? Or would they say that you're stingy and guarded and you can be talked into doing some nice things, but I have to pull it out of you. Frankly, I didn't like some of the things that I saw and I looked at my own life. I need to grow in this area. Some final, final words. That doesn't mean I'm just do almost done, but it just means it's the last part. <laughs> Generosity is one of the five core values of West Valley Christian Church. One of the things that Rob Pastor Rob has brought is that he has identified core values for our church. A lot of organizations and churches and businesses come up with core values. You'll see them at Chick-fil-A and other places. We just never got that done, but he brought that. And one of the five core values at West Valley is generosity. That means we feel like it's very, very important, and it is. Side note, do you know what the other four core values of West Valley Christian Church are? Let me tell you what they are. Uh, fun is one, that we would have fun, and we have a lot of fun together at West Valley, right? Um, excellence is another. We try to do our best for the Lord, and, and it is, do it as well as we can. Life change is one, a core value that we want to see your life change and our lives change as leaders so that we grow more like Jesus. You know, I, I learned a new, a new word through, through George Barna. He's kind of a research guru for the Christian community. And he said in a lot of the Christian world today, there are people who consider themselves Christians. They would say that quickly. The integrated Christian is the one whose behavior matches their words. It's called an integrated Christian. Barna says there are a lot of people who 
claim to be Christians and they would say it easily. But their behavior does not match their beliefs and their words. We need to be, I want to be an integrated Christian by that definition. So uh, life change is one. The last one is team. Team. That we're not silos. We are a team together. We're a family. And we can get more done together than we can by ourselves. I want you to look at just one last scripture with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And if you're in Matthew, turn to your right and you will go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, and 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And verse 6 through 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6 through 11. And it explains what generosity is and how it works. And so again at 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 6 through 11 and I really want you to turn there with me because I want you to see these words with your eyes. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 6. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth and said, remember this, sounds like it's important. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Do you know the context of this verse? It is financial giving. Because they were trying to raise money to help in a famine. And so the whole, yes, we can give resources, uh, possessions, time, talents. But in this discussion of generosity, it's talking about financial giving to God and His people. So the principle that God says here is that if we are sowing sparingly in our financial giving, that God will be sparingly with us in what He shares with us. But if we're generous in our giving, he will be generous with us. In verse 7 it says, each man, each person should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. It doesn't matter what Pastor Rob thinks. It doesn't matter what Pastor Glenn or any of us think. What matters is what God thinks. It says, for God loves a cheerful giver. In verse 8 it says that God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things at all times having all that you need you will abound in every good work. What's it saying there? It says that God's promise to us if we're generous with Him and with people in need it says that we will always have enough for ourselves and we'll always have enough to share with every good work. The example of God, how He gives, is in verse 9. As it is written from Psalms, He has scattered abroad His gifts to the poor, and His righteousness endures forever. God is a giver, right? I mean, we know that. He gives gifts to the poor, especially those that are in need. And that's His definition of righteousness. Verse 10, Now He sub who supplies seed to the sower, and bread for food, and who is that person? God will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. God will not only supply our needs, but He will also help us to help others. In verse 11, it says, You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. I don't think this means wealthy in context of how it's written here. I think rich, you could say, having extra would be a way to understand this verse in a better way. We'll always have enough that we have for ourselves, plus enough extra if we grow in this area of generosity so we can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. God will be honored through what we share with Him. Um, I can't tell you how strongly that I feel in this section of generosity. And the thing that, this is all obviously a very generous congregation. You know what happens, you know whenever you've turned the corner in this matter of financial giving to God, is whenever you have tested it out, which God says to do that, and whenever you see that God takes care of you, not only does He replace what you gave, but He also expands things. 
after 52 years in the ministry, uh, and longer than that, a Christian. I have seen, Carol and I have seen in our own lives that I have said, I am embarrassed to tell people if I was to tell you, if I was to tell you what God has done in this arena, I, I'd be violating <laughs> the scripture. And so I, I couldn't do that. But we believe in every heart. We're not afraid to give to God because God always returns what you share. And when we are stingy and afraid we won't have enough, that is whenever we haven't turned the corner on understanding how this all operates. And uh, I like what somebody said, if all of us went on welfare and tithed, there would be an increase in the giving in the church. That's not a Bible quote, but those that have studied, I agree with them. A question that's important is how is the unselfishness and generosity of all of us at West Valley Christian Church impacting our community? At our last staff meeting, that's what Pastor Rob Denton asked all of us on staff. There's about 10 of us. And he asked us, are we impacting the needy and the poor, those that need help in our area and in our community? Do they even know we're here? Do they, do they know that we're doing anything? We're trying anything? And it was a pondering, thoughtful question. He asked us to think about two weeks on that, and then we talk about it together as a staff. And so I ask you, how are we impacting our community with the very thing that Jesus is talking about, generosity and unselfishness? I have a challenge for you this week. Only one thing that I'd like to challenge you for. You may never have done this ever in your life. My challenge and goal for you is to do something for someone else this week that helps them. Someone who is poor or needy or just needs desperately help. And that only God would know and God would see what you are doing. That's the challenge. The one thing before next Sunday comes, I'm challenging you, I'm challenging me to help someone without them knowing that you did it. You don't tell your spouse, you don't tell your neighbor, you don't tell anybody else. It's in secret because you are the only one, you and God, that knows what you're doing. Max Licato, great Christian author, he talks about old Eddie. It happens every Friday evening almost without fail. When the sun resembles a giant orange and it's starting to dip into the blue ocean, the sun. Old Ed comes strolling along the beach to his favorite pier, clutching in his bony hand a bucket of shrimp. Ed walks out to the end of the pier where it seems he almost has the world to himself. The glow of the sun is a golden bronze now. Everyone's gone except for a few joggers on the beach. And standing on the end of the pier, Ed is alone with his thoughts and his bucket of shrimp. Before long, however, he's not a, alone any longer. Up in the sky, there's a thousand white dots, com dots coming screeching and squawking, winging their way towards that lanky frame standing there on the end of the pier. And before long, dozens of seagulls have enveloped him, their wings fluttering, flapping wildly. And Ed stands there, tossing shrimp to the hungry birds. And as he does, if you listen closely, you can hear him say with a smile, thank you, thank you. In a few for short sentences, uh, minutes I mean, the bucket is empty. But Ed doesn't leave. He stands there lost in thought as though transported to another time and place. Invariably, one of the gulls lands on his sea-bleached, weather-beaten hat, an old military hat that he's been wearing for years. And when he finally turns around and begins to walk back toward the beach, a few of the birds hop along the pier with him until he gets to the stairs, and then they too fly away. And old Ed quietly makes his way down to the end of the pier and on to his home. If you were sitting there on the pier with your fishing line in the water, Ed might seem like a funny old duck, as my dad 
Max Licato used to say, or a guy that's a sandwich shy of a picnic, as his kids might say. To onlookers, he's just another old codger, lost in his own weird world, feeding the seagulls with a bucket full of shrimp. To the onlooker, rituals can look either strange or very empty. They can seem altogether unimportant, maybe even a lot of nonsense. Old folks seem to do strange things, at least in the eyes of boomers and busters. Most of them would probably write old Ed off. Down there in Florida. That's too bad. They'd do well to know him better. His full name, Eddie Rickenbacker. He was a famous hero back in World War II. On one of his flying missions across the Pacific Ocean, he and his seven-member crew went down. Miraculously, all the men survived, crawled out of their plane, and climbed into a life raft. Captain Rickenbacker and his crew floated for days on the rough waters of the Pacific in the middle of the ocean. They fought the sun, blisters upon blisters upon blisters. They fought sharks, and most of all, they fought hunger. And by the eighth day, their rations ran out. No food, no water. They were hundreds of miles from land, and no one knew where they were. They needed a miracle. That afternoon, they had a simple devotional service and prayed for a miracle. Two of them particularly were near death. They tried to nap. Eddie leaned back and pulled his military cap over his nose, and time dragged. And all he could hear was the slap of the waves against the raft. Suddenly, Eddie felt something land on the top of his cap. It was a seagull. And old Ed would later describe how he sat perfectly still, planning his next move. And with a flash of his hand and a squawk from the gull, he managed to grab it and wring its neck. He tore the feathers off, and he and his starving crew made a meal, a very slight meal, for eight men. Then they used the intestines for bait, and with it they caught fish, and they gave them food from the fish and more bait from their intestines. And the cycle continued. With that simple survival technique, they were able to endure the rigors of the sea until they were found and rescued after 24 days out in the open sea. Eddie Rickenbacker lived many years beyond that ordeal, but he never forgot the sacrifice of that first life-giving seagull. And he never stopped saying thank you. That's why almost every Friday night, he would walk to the end of the pier with a bucket full of shrimp and a heart full of gratitude. This week, one person in need, one family to help, one gift, only God sees, only God knows. Don't let anyone else know.